the days and hours that I stood here as a child, asking everyone that passed by, hey, mister, give us a push. I go on, mister, give us a push. And of course, if they didn't push you, you had to push yourself. You see all that rust? That's all for the want of pushing and swinging. When I was a kid, that was shining like silver, and it was going around like a merry-go-round. In all the millions of times I've been in the park, I never climbed up those steps. It was like a game or a challenge. Get into the park without walking on a step. So this is the way we came up. There's a weathercock. I was coming through here one night and there was an old man sitting there and he was filling his pipe with those. And I said to him, is that good tobacco, mister? So he said, well, I'll tell you something, son. There's no tax on it. Well, we always crossed here. I don't know why we crossed here, but we did. And then we went up the rest of it like this, all hanging onto the bars all up the steps the same way. Of course, if you fell out there, the crocodiles got you. I suppose it was variety, but this is the way it went, on up the path. And when we got to the top here, we used to go under there. But they have it all barred up now. And there's the grooves of the bike, all down along here, where fellas got their bicycles, went down the hill. Oh, look at this is where the kids have made a way up, rather than walk to the top of the steps. I used to be able to go up this like a mountain goat. Get in there! Ah, turn, turn! B and I and the civil service towns end street. I said to one of the B and I young ones, so, so there was never anyone like you playing football in the Phoenix Park when I was a young fella. She so she missed off when you were the young fella, the park wasn't here. Isn't that terrible? And to think of all the times I come up to this 15 acres playing for St. Michael's. Cheer up St. Michael's, they're known everywhere. They bet down Sing Street and left them lying there. Sing Street called for mercy and mercy wasn't there. So cheer up St. Michael's, they're known everywhere. And oh, many's the time I stood in the goalpost, taking off saves like Paddy Cullen. And many's the time I stood in the goalpost and was buried. And then, of course, when we won the match, we all got a slice of orange, and the master gave us a wink and told us not to bother about the ecker. And of course, when we lost, well, there was no slice of orange, and nothing was said about the ecker. Oh, the B&I are scuttled here tonight. They call it the 15 acres. 15 acres? There's 1,752 acres in the Phoenix Park, seven miles in circumference. And to think that King Charles II of England was going to give it to his mistress as a present. He was trying to get rid of her. So he says, uh, would you like a little garden in Dublin? So she what's the name of it? Oh, so see, His Majesty's Garden, the Phoenix. The Duchess of Cleveland said, yes, that'd be nice. 
But of course, the Duke of Ormond and a few of the boys moved in and said, no way, Charles. You're not giving away the Phoenix Park. Certainly not to your mistress. So the park was kept. The first man to lay out the Phoenix Park was the Duke of Ormond around the 1660s. He built the walls and put the deer in it, but he wanted it as a private deer park for royalty. The man who opened it up to the public was Lord Chesterfield. He built this Phoenix Monument. We used to call this the Eagle Monument when we were kids. But if you think that's bad, mixing a Phoenix up for an Eagle, wait till you hear this. I was playing a football match up here one night, and one of my pals said, I'll meet you up in the park. So I said, OK, where do I meet you? He says, I'll see you up on the steps of the burnt board. Behind me, of course, is the Vice Regal Lodge, the gates now of Oris on Uchtaran. The house was originally built by a man called Nathaniel Clemens. He was one of the park rangers. Of course, rangers in those years were all big shots. And then later it was sold for the Viceroy's house. All the Lord Lieutenants, all the kings and queens of England came, stayed here. And then of course it changed over to the Free State in 1922. The American Embassy was the Chief Secretary's Lodge. It was built by John Blackwire. In 1772, John was bailiff in the Phoenix Park and secretary to Lord Harcourt. He had a four-room cottage, a potato patch, and grazing for six cows. He got a bit of land and 8,000 pounds, built this house, and earned a nickname in Dublin, the King's Cowboy, because he had unlimited grazing in the Phoenix Park. The Kearney family out doing a bit of running. The memories I have of this park here, this was the army sports ground. It was all fenced in all the way around. And this was a miniature Olympics. Once a year, there'd be jumping and running and pole vaulting and relay races. And right up at the back there, there'd be tables lined across with green cloths on them. And all the silver cups and medals and Waterford glass bowls and clocks and watches, oh, magnificent presents. And all along here, a big marquee for, of course, entertaining all the officers and our ladies and our friends. We went up to the tent, Mr. Let's in, get the hell out of that. So we ran around the back and we got down on our knees and we lifted up the tent, put our heads in. Oh, the sight, all the tables and the cloths and the excitement, the sun coming through the marquee, all the ladies with their hats and the officers with their Sam Brown belts and uniforms, and the table all laid out with china cups and saucers and bottles of champagne and lemonade and cakes and ham sandwiches. This is where I tasted my first ham sandwich. I didn't even know ham sandwiches existed. Bread and dripping and salt or bread and jam or bread and margarine, yes. But ham sandwiches, there was a lady and she was cutting, putting them on the plate. And oh, the smell of the ham, the smell of the fresh bread and the butter. So of course, as she was cutting them and putting them on the plate, we were putting up our hands and taking them out. And when she finished, she looked at the plate and she let a scream out of her and threw her hands up into the air. And an officer said, there they are, there they are. Out, up, over the railings, up the 15 acres, 
and half the free state army after us. As Bonkers said later on, and we come on back by Knockmore Down Hill, they should have given us the medals. No one caught us today. We were the best runners in the army sports. See, you know what I feel like doing now? I feel like going off and having a pint and a couple of ham sandwiches. Because I think this is the 50th anniversary of my first ham sandwich in the Phoenix Park. This is where Molly Apple used to stand. In Cork, they call apples mollies. Well, in Dublin, we had a Molly Apple. And she stood here with our big Harry sieve basket. And it was loaded with apples, pears, oranges, sweets, licorices, everything. And in the center piece was a lovely square bar of chocolate, a half-time Jimmy. But a half-time Jimmy was threepence halfpenny. And we'd be lucky if we had a halfpenny. Now, if we hadn't spent it in Kilmain or Maroilham Bridge, this was the last stop before we headed for the 15 acres. You wouldn't even get a drink of water up there. You got a drink of water across the way. The fountain is gone now. And you came over here to spend your halfpenny with Molly Apple. Well, we were all dying for a half-time Jimmy. And one day, seven of us bunced in and we bought a bar of half-time Jimmy. And you know something? It tasted terrible. So half-time Jimmy looked better in the box. It was a footballer kicking a ball. Half-time Jimmy and Molly Apple's corner. This is St. Thomas's Hill. That's a very interesting name because the land here belonged to the monks of Kilmainham the Knights Hospitallers of St. John in Jerusalem, founded by Strongbow. St. Thomas, I suppose that was the liberty of Thomas's court in Denor. So does that mean that the land here was given by the monks of Kilmainham to the monks of Thomas's court? Because the monks of Thomas's court also had land down at Leakstep St. Catherine's. Well, after the suppression, this land became part of the Crown lands. And then there was land exchange for land in Cornwall by a man named Fisher. And he built a house here on the hill. And he called the house Phoenix House. They say he took the name from the clear stream, the Fionishka, clear water, that he saw from his top window as he looked out across the park. After seven years, Fisher sold the house back to the Crown the Crown now used it for their viceroys, the Cromwells, the Essex. And they were in command here on the hill. They gave up the King's House and Chapel Lizard. And then, of course, they went off the hill over to the Vice Regal where Orison Ucteron is today. In 1734, it was decided to build a magazine fort on the hill. Dean Swift and a friend came out here. And he saw all the concrete and the mixers and the bricks and blocks and what have you. See, what are they doing? Oh, Shaman, they're building a magazine for the defence of the city. Oh, be the holy Sistine Dean Swift. And as he tottered home to the deanery from the park that evening, smiling to himself, he composed a little verse. Behold the proof of Irish sense, here Irish wit is seen. When nothing's left that's worth defence, we build a magazine. The magazine fort was attacked in 1916 by the FINA and the volunteers. They actually took over the magazine fort. The idea was to blow up the ammunition and powder store. They set the fuses, lit them, and withdrew. But just as the fuses got to about six inches from the door, they went out. The Phoenix Cricket Club is the fifth oldest in the world, dating from 1830. When we were chiselers coming up to the park, it wasn't football or hurling we wanted. It was cricket and polo. 
We used to sneak in and sit beside all the white shirt, white trouser gentlemen watching the cricket. Their eyes would be focused out in front. They wouldn't even see us beside them. Well, I have the white shirt. All I need is the moment, the white trousers, white shoes. And those pad yokes were going up your legs. And of course, along about that. And I tell you something, Mr. Packer would be looking for me. And when we got home, Tinchy Core and Kilmaine, and we were all cricket mad. And we searched him for butter boxes and orange boxes to make wickets. But those sort of wickets weren't as popular as the old wicket drawn on a wall with chalk. But then the danger was whether it was hit or not. So some fellas, to make sure it was hit, they used to wet the ball. And of course, if there'd be a dirty big glove in the middle of the wicket, well, there was no denying you were out. And of course, when the players would get warm, they'd take off their pullovers and hand them to the umpire. And he used to tie them around his waist. And we'd say, Mister, Mister, was that part of the game, Mister? What's he doing that for, Mister? Is that part of the game? How is he? And then, of course, when a batsman was knocked out, he'd be coming in very dejected looking, and we'd give him a little pat on the back. You are great, Mister. You are great. It's a pity you were knocked out that time, Mister. You are great. Yes, cricket up in the park. It's crystal clear and ice cool. Now this old well here in the Phoenix Park is called Baker's Well, but I suppose that's a name as local as Barney's Hill. The Duke of Ormond, who laid out this park, was complaining about the stomach. So he went to Dr. Edmund O'Mara, and O'Mara told him to drink a cup of spa well water every day. Now, I wonder, did the Duke of Ormond come up here? I feel like running around the 15 acres. The official name of this place is Knock Mary, but the locals in the Lizard call it Barney's Hill, on account of Barney living in the house there. It's up behind the old Cheshire homes, and behind that is the spire of St. Mary's Chest Hospital. St. Mary's was originally the Hibernian Military Academy that's where they taught young boys and sent them off to war to the green fields of France, and many of them never came home again. And there was many another poor child never even saw the green fields of France. They died here at 8, 9, 10, and 11 years of age. The old dog pond. Well, I suppose, like every kid in Dublin, we brought every mongrel in Dublin up here. Some of them are powerful swimmers, and others, God bless us, they nearly drowned. Well, when we were kids, there used to be an old lad who used to sit over on the far bank there with his overcoat on him. And, of course, when a few American visitors would come and sit on this seat, he'd throw off the overcoat, dive in, swim across, and come up the bank here. And of course, the amazed Americans would be looking at all this, and he'd tell them that uh, not to bother that he was practicing for swimming the channel. And of course, go on with the story and collect a few dollars to pay for the boat and all the gear, etc. And then, of course, in the gate would come the ranger, 
And of course, old Jem would be around the bank, pick up his coat and charge up in his bed and cost you all the way up the cricket ground. And then, of course, the next day, be back again. Well, Lord rest him today and all the times that he swam across there. I don't know if he ever got around to swim in the channel, but he sure did swim the dog pond. Well, up in the dog pond, I met these wonderful boys and girls and dogs of Bridgefoot Street. And they asked me my name. And when I told them, they said they knew one of my poems. What poem? In Dublin. In Dublin. How does it, where did you learn it? In Scale Frost Street. And Brundrick Street. And Brundrick, what way does it go? Climb up, up the hill and gaze afar, and wonder strange on where you were. For ancient copper sounds right here, sanctified by those who knew no fear in Dublin. Very good. And you learnt that at school? Yeah. yeah. And you left school now? Yeah, I'm in second job. Your yeah, second job? Second year yeah, in Emmett Road. Oh, Emmett Road Tech. Yeah. And um, what are you learning there? Uh, I'm not going into it yet, going in one. Oh, you're going into that, and then yeah, you do, you're leaving there, will you? Yeah, we're yes. going in there, and we're doing all the carpentry, woodworking, and And you'll be all the future Thank scholars you. and tradesmen and probably mm. doctors and barristers of Dublin, huh? Do you like the old dog pond? Yeah, yeah. Come up here. What's the dog's show. name? Rex and Patch. Rex and Patch. Which is Rex? The big the one. Black the black one. Black one. And who's the best fella? Rex. 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 Yeah. I noticed that the point fella didn't go into the water much. He waited to pull the stick to come out, and then he took it out. Didn't he? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Get him in once more for a round off. Rex and Patch. Okay. The Irish Ordnance Survey. The word ordnance is French origin, army, artillery, personnel. The Ordnance Survey are here since 1825. The house was built by Luke Gardner. Luke was the keeper at Castleknock Gate. His son Charles became Lord Mountjoy, was actually killed in the Battle of 1798. In 1812, it was Mountjoy Cavalry Barracks, and every morning and afternoon sent a mounted escort across to the Voice Regal Lodge. The first survey was carried out by Sir William Petty, but he was a, a chief in Cromwell's army, and his fame became known in 1665 as the Down Survey. Mapping today is greatly changed from the days of Sir William Petty with his stone tablets and copper plate. There were three sets of Petty's surveys, one in London, one in Dublin, and one with Petty. So Petty decided to send his across Tingham for safekeeping, and sure wasn't it captured by French pirates, and it's in Paris today. The London copy was born in a fire in the Tower of London Surveyor General's Office in 1711. And the Dublin copy was born in the fire in the Four Courts in 1922. But sure, as my good friend, the late Kevin Brennan, who worked in the Ordnance Survey and was a great lover of old Dublin, used to say, sure, now that we're in the EEC, maybe the French will give us back the originals. Did you ever notice the different types of grass in the Phoenix Park? Bishop Stillingfleet said one time that the finest mutton he ever tasted was from sheep reared on dog-tailed grass. Well, actually, it was the second best mutton. The best, he said, was sheep reared 
on purple silver band, fine band, silver hair and dog tail combined. And who was Stillingfleet? Stillingfleet was a man who collected so many books that he had the finest private library in the world. Over 10,000 volumes. And where are they all today? They're all in the heart of the liberties in Marsh's library. Because Archbishop Marsh went over to the auction, all oh, the English nearly went mad. They wanted the king to intervene, not to allow the books out of London. But Marsh brought them back to Dublin. Staying fleet was an expert on many things, particularly grass. But then wouldn't you be an expert too if you had 10,000 volumes to draw on? It's not a lovely sight, a mother coot and her two chicks and tea time. The beauty of the furry glen and the glen pond never fails to thrill me. No matter what time I come here, in the springtime, it's all hawthorn and cherry blossoms. In summer, the ducks, the coots, the water lilies. In autumn, this is a wonderland of countless colours of golden brown and sunlight yellow. And even in winter, when the trees are bare, the snowflakes form their own magic designs and patterns on the trees, and the lake here takes on a shining silver appearance like a skating rink. <laughs> 